Okay, so what I want to do today is talk to you about um, the very big and the very small. And I want to talk to you about how the very small can influence the very big in the context of Earth systems. And so I want to take you from a fjord, which is a model system that uh, I'm working in, uh, an ecosystem, the way you might study an organism in the model sense, uh, to talk about the implications of that system and the study uh, to uh, the global ocean. And first, I want to acknowledge the people that have done this work. Uh, some really talented people have been involved. And you know, of course, we work in networks here. We, we can't do it alone. And I just want to highlight David Walsh here, who's a postdoc, who's done the bulk of the metagenomic analysis. And he's recently taken a position at Concordia uh, University in Canada. Uh, and Elise Hawley is a, a new PhD student who's uh, done some of the work that I'm going to end on in terms of uh, gene expression studies. And uh, this is the rest of the lab. Of course, I want to acknowledge our collaborators in the Institute for Ocean Sciences who help us do the field work. Uh, folks here at the Joint Genome Institute, I mean, this list could be much and should be much longer, but we work a lot with uh, Susanna and Tiana on these projects. And our collaborators at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratories who've been enabling us to conduct some early stage proteomic investigations of the water column. And so what I want to do is, kind of as a, by way of introduction, talk to you about four things. Uh, I want to discuss the problem of expanding oxygen minimum zones and give you a biological context for understanding the science that's taking place. Uh, I want to discuss this Saanich Inlet, um, a fjord that I work in, and, and talk to you about it as a natural laboratory. We treat this, as, a, as I alluded to before, as a model system, the way you might study an organism. And then I want to talk a little bit about the ecological genomics paradigm, which is how we study in this natural laboratory. And then finally, if I don't use all my time, take you on a bit of an exploration along an open ocean transect that reflects back onto the science that we're doing in the inlet. And so oxygen minimum zones are regions of low dissolved oxygen concentration that are an intrinsic feature of the marine water column. They're also very widespread. And so here you can see a map of the global ocean. And from a standpoint of interpreting the colors here, okay, uh, purple and blue are low oxygen, and red would be considered high oxygen. You're looking at a slice of the ocean at 800 meters. Okay, so we've gone down from the surface to 800 meters, and we've measured the oxygen across the global ocean. And what you can see noticeably is there's these extensive purple, i.e., areas of low dissolved oxygen off many of our coasts. Okay, and these are considered um, oxygen minimum zones. Uh, some of the well-studied systems range from the Namibian upwelling system and the coast of Africa, the Arabian Sea, the Black Sea, which would be considered an enclosed uh, oxygen minimum zone, and the Baltic Sea. Uh, on the west side, we have the subarctic Pacific, all the way down into the Oregon coast, Saanich Inlet, which I'll talk about today. And then there's an extensive oxygen minimum zone off the coast of Chile. So all of these places have been sites of study, uh, and they provide comparative context to this work. So why do we care about oxygen minimum zones and oxygen minimum zone expansion? This is taken from a really exceptional review article by Robert Diaz that was published in Science uh, uh, more than a year ago. And this depicts energy flow through the water column, through the, through the marine system respect to uh, how the energy is partitioned among what you might say uh, multicellular organisms and microbial life. So consumers like fish, which we care about in the context of fisheries, all the way down to individual microbes that are actually uh, autotrophic and able to fix their own carbon. And so in a fully oxygenated water column, a lot of the energy available is there for uh, larger uh, marine fauna. But as the system becomes more and more anoxic, and whether that's a seasonal kind of phenomenon or a long-term and persistent phenomenon, what you see is as you move down the energy curve that the available energy to the system becomes more and more available to bacteria, microbes in general, and less to those organisms higher up on the food chain. And this culminates in sort of permanent stratification of the system, complete anoxia, and the accumulation of hydrogen sulfide, which as you know is toxic to uh, eukaryotic, most eukaryotic life forms. Okay, so what we want to understand is our place along this energy curve in the context of oxygen minimum zones, both on the coast and in the open ocean. And so we look at that through the window of microbial metabolism. 
and a long redox gradient. So how does microbial metabolism shift along these redox gradients and how does that tie into biogeochemical cycles, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, sulfur cycle. So from that small scale to the big with respect to the summation of metabolism as it affects things like the global climate. And the reason that oxygen minimum zone expansion is something that we want to be concerned about is that the processes, the anaerobic processes that take place in these systems are effectively creating a nitrogen sink. So biologically useful nitrogen is removed from the system as nitrogen gas that leaves. So it's not available for, for living things. It's also a source, these oxygen minimum zones, of greenhouse gas. So the production of nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, as well as methane. <coughs> and they're expanding, as I alluded to, and they're intensifying. So it doesn't, it's not just a question of whether you've got more volume, it's also the extent to which that hypoxia exists and occurs. And so this is a, an example of that expansion as measured over a 40-year time series that was published uh, by, by Strom et al. Uh, in a paper uh, on expanding oxygen minimum zones. Uh, we're looking specifically at the equatorial Pacific Ocean. And just to orient you, along the y-axis, we're looking at depth as a measure of pressure. And along the x-axis, we're looking at time. So we've got over 40 years of data here. And again, the colors are red is high oxygen, and purple would be low oxygen. And what you can sort of see here is that this blue region around 500 to 800 meters is showing an intensification overall with respect to the oxygen loss, but also an expansion. So there's a slight shoaling with respect to this um, particular depth, and you can see that we're moving downward towards 1,000 meters here. And so they calculated the trend line, and they also indicated that the oxygen loss is about 74 millimoles per meter squared per year. Okay, so this is significant. And this isn't just happening in the Pacific. It's happening throughout the global ocean, and some believe it's a response to global warming. And so what I want to do is then take you now to a system in which we, we can start to ask, how are microbes contributing to this process with respect to the biogeochemical cycling in oxygen minimum zone. How do we use them as indicators? How do we use them to both model and monitor these processes so that we can better um, cope with the consequences? And so Saanich Inlet is a biodynamic ecosystem that undergoes seasonal stratification and deep water renewal. So what that means is that during the spring into summer, there's a lot of primary productivity in the surface waters. That carbon becomes remineralized by heterotrophic aerobic respiring organisms. They use up all the oxygen in the water column, so you get this gradient of oxygenated surface waters to anoxic deep waters. And then during the, the fall, uh, there's a, an influx of oxygenated nutrient-rich water that mixes the system up, so every year it recharges. And so we, we look at this as a model ecosystem in which we can ask questions about oxygen minimum zones across every possible range of oxygen concentration in the water column. So this is Saanich Inlet, it's long. This is the cross section. It's about 200 meters deep at its deepest point in the basin. And then there's a glacial sill here at the mouth of the inlet that restricts the water from flowing in and circulating. So what happens is that that stratification gets set up right around here, uh, where we go from oxygenated water, hypoxic, to deep anaerobic water in the basin, okay? So we want you to keep that in mind as we start to do our sampling in this system. And what makes the system very special is that it's been studied for many, many decades. So this is a, a series of data points uh, that have been collected. We're using uh, depth here along the Y and time along the X. And so over 60 years of contextual metadata has been sampled or taken from this environment, mostly CTD kind of data, oxygen, temperature, salinity, that sort of thing. And so we can turn these data points into graphs like this that represent the long-term physiology of the fjord. So we can look here at salinity trends, temperature, oxygen, and nitrate profiles. So you can take, let's say, oxygen over that time interval and you can plot that as a contour. And what you can see, this is the mean oxygen concentration over a 40-year span from 1960 to 2000. And again, red is high oxygen, blue is low oxygen. And this represents that cycle of seasonal stratification and deep water renewal. So you can see is that from April into August, the deep waters become anaerobic, and that in the fall, there's this influx of oxygenated water from the, from the strait, Harrow Strait. Nitrate, it's a bit more pronounced. You can see that nitrate is depleted in the water column. The height of that depletion occurs during peak stratification. 
And then during the fall, there's this influx of nitrate into the deep water. And so the questions that we want to answer are who are the major microbial constituents of the oxygen deficient water column? And can we identify spatiotemporal patterns in microbial community structure and metabolic capacity? And then how do these patterns relate to the function of the ecosystem as a whole? For example, the biogeochemical cycling of carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. And finally, how similar is this community that we find in Zanich to that of other oxygen zones around the world? So how can we use what we gain with respect to knowledge in Zanich as a model? And so we've chosen to use that ecological genomics approach to get at those questions. And that's relatively straightforward to most of you in terms of the workflow itself, the approach that we take. But I'm just going to go over it real briefly uh, so we're all on the same page. The idea is that we're constructing these metagenomic libraries that traverse different compartments of the water column. So from fully oxygenated surface waters through the transition zone down into the anoxic basin. And we're at the same time describing the vertical distribution of dissolved gases, such as oxygen and methane, nitrous oxide, and measuring nutrients, ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, etc. The idea being that that is the physiological readout of the system. We need that to interpret the genomic information. And then we're going to be comparing those profiles, both the genomic and molecular profiles, to that chemical nutrient data to identify the key microbial groups and metabolic pathways that are operating in the system. Okay? And then we're going to use that information to develop predictive frameworks to effectively diagnose nutrient and energy flow patterns in response to changing levels of water column oxygen deficiency. So there's a three-component workflow to this Okay, so what you see here is our time series. There's three years of data here. We're still collecting. We do a monthly sampling in the inlet. So this is two years out of date now, unfortunately. That's how much information we have to synthesize. But what you can see is that this is oxygen, and you can see the pattern of stratification is consistently measured across three years, as well as renewal um, in the deep basin. And what we're doing is we're taking four depths, 10 meters, 100 meters, 120 meters, and 200 meters, and we're producing large insert genomic libraries from biomass from each of those four depths across the time series. Okay? So we were able to generate 16 libraries representing uh, winter, summer, renewal, and spring time points along, uh, along the line. And effectively, the three-part or three-component system is to extract uh, nucleic acids and protein from the biomass. Uh, we have a whole series of bioinformatic steps that have to take place in order to interpret the results. And then finally, from the systems level of the integration part, we're basically trying to compare and relate the physical parameters, the nutrient in parameters, with the resulting uh, data sets that are generated for the molecular. And so this is a snapshot of the microbial community structure that we're able to discern from the Sanogen water column. And what you can see here, this is 10 meters, 100 meters, 120 down to 200 meters, and these are time points. So there's a lot of information here. This is, you can imagine, this is a dot plot that uh, would be effectively turned into a microarray, okay, if you were looking at the species level and trying to identify organisms. At the top here, we have various microbial groups. It's not that important that you discern specific groups here, but more to look at the patterns with respect to the size of those individual dots. And one thing that really stands out without looking too much at this is that right here we see this very abundant group of microorganisms that stands out below 100 meters in, in the basin waters. And that group of organisms turns out to be called sub-5. And so I want to turn the focus of the talk into the small, the very small right now, and highlight the particular role of this organism that we've been able to discern from the metagenomic approach. So sub-5 is dominant below the oxycline, and it can reach up to 40% of the total bacterial population uh, in the water column. And when we look at the taxonomic structure of this group of organisms, um, we actually see that it's closely related to the symbionts of deep sea clams and mussels. So here we have Bathmodiolus, a mussel, and um, these, uh, these deep sea clams um, over here, uh, Ruthia, for instance. And sub-5 is up here in red from Saanich Inlet. Okay, we can see there's some structure to sub-5. And we can also map sequences from other oxygen minimum zones where it's been identified, such as in the Namibian upwelling system, the eastern South Pacific off the coast of Chile, and so forth. So it's widespread in its distribution pattern, and it's closely related 
based on the tree to these symbiont populations. So that's pretty interesting. So here we have these aerobic symbionts that live in uh, these invertebrates that are involved in nutritional and detoxification services for their hosts, we find a very similar organism perhaps living in uh, the anaerobic part of the water column. And as I alluded to, this is also a very widespread organism. So in every oxygen minimum zone that's been looked at to date, you can find the molecular signature of sub-5, okay? And so again, over here, this is in Saanich Inlet, and these are some of the other oxygen minimum zones that are highlighted on the map. And you know, it can represent anywhere from five to 35% of the microbial um, signatures that people recover from those systems. So it seems to be a ubiquitous oxygen minimum zone uh, member, and it's, uh, it's quite abundant. And so we can track that population through the water column in Saanich Inlet, okay? So we wanna be able to leverage such an abundant organism could be a sentinel. It could tell us something about the physiological state of the water column, not just its own physiology. And so here what we're doing is we're basically tracking the taxonomic signature of sub-5 at 100, 10, 100, 120, and 200 meters uh, through time. And what we can see is that it rises and falls in terms of the total number of tags that we're able to identify. And we're actually picking up some structure within sub-5. That is that there are different potential ecotypes that come online during that renewal period. We can do the same thing with the genomic sequence data that we discern. And so one of the benefits of having a highly abundant organism in a complex data set like this is that when we do assemble our reads, and we have about 25 million base pairs per library, in terms of those large insert libraries, these are paired ends, we can assemble quite large contigs representing large insert clones. And we were able to do that and then map those clones onto th these reference genomes that are actually available for the clam symbionts. And so we can then map the coverage of the genomic signature of sub-5 through the rotor column, and it pretty much mirrors the taxonomic information that we're able to discern. And so from the standpoint of assembling a genome, because what we really want to be able to do is not just track the presence of the organism and its abundance, but to then go in and dissect its metabolic potential. What we were able to do is we were able to take our combined assemblies across the water column at different depths at different times and to come up with um, a relatively compact but comprehensive uh, metagenomic assembly representing this group. So you have to think of it as a composite. All right, we used a tetranucleotide frequency method to identify sub-5 specific scaffolds and then we were able to use that information in a PCA analysis to effectively bin sub-5 to this particular quadrant, okay? And all the scaffolds that I'm gonna talk about come from right in here. Completed phosmid sequences that we were able to generate that had phylogenetic anchors for sub-5 also grouped in this quadrant, okay? And so collectively within here, we were able to identify 19 scaffolds, okay, that represented roughly uh, 1.2 million base pairs. And then from that, we were able to go in and infer metabolic pathways. So this is a, a diagram that shows the relationship of sub-5 to the symbiont reference genomes that I alluded to from the clam. And there are about 450 unique genes that can be been to sub-5, and there's considerable overlap with the symbiont genomes. Okay, so what we want to know, we want to focus in on what makes sub-5 different, but we also might want to say, well, what do we know about the physiology of the symbionts that we can uh, infer in sub-5? And one thing that they share in common is they both appear to be autotrophic uh, carbon fixers. So they're able to take CO2 and convert that into biomass. So they have the Rubisco genes. So that's one commonality. So SUP5 is an autotroph. They also have a number of genes involved in sulfur oxidation. And so that's one of the functions of the clam symbiont, probably, is a detoxification service that it provides the host. And so they share a lot of the same machinery with respect to sulfur oxidation, with the exception of this one flavocytochrome C, which is unique to the sub-5 metagenome. They're able to use a number of reduced sulfur compounds in addition to hydrogen sulfide, including thiosulfate and elemental sulfur. But what makes sub-5 very special or unique in this case is its ability to use nitrate. So as I alluded to, the clam symbionts are aerobic. Well, SUP5 has picked up along the way the machinery for nitrate respiration. So it breathes nitrate as opposed to oxygen, and it couples sulfur oxidation to denitrification. And this is important with respect to what we see in the oxygen minimum zone as a whole. 
And what's even more interesting is that SUP5 actually has two nitrate reductase genes that are separate. Okay, it has the NAP and the NAR machinery. NAR is believed to function under anaerobic conditions. Whereas NAP, there is some evidence that it can actually work under microaerophilic conditions. And so this got us thinking about whether or not SUP5 is able to tune its energy metabolism to changes in water column redox status. And what was really interesting from the genome assembly is that all of these pathways are integrated in an island. You might call it a metabolic island in which nitrate reduction and sulfur oxidation pathways that are specifically uniquely SUP5 are all bundled together and potentially regulated to, together in a coordinate way. And what you can see is that NAP and NAR are closely linked together in this region of the genome. The FCC component of the sulfur oxidation pathway is linked. There's actually carbon fixation pathway components linked. And there's a series of regulators of the FNR family that are believed to be redox-driven transcription factors that are also linked here. And so we may have the workings of a regulon that specifically senses the redox status of the water column and tunes the energy metabolism of SUP5 accordingly. And we wanted to actually test that. And so this gave us the opportunity with our, um, our friends at the Pacific Northwest National Labs to go in and use our genome assembly as a database for identifying uh, peptides that were obtained from the water column. And specifically, we focused at the 100 meters and the 200 meters, sort of the extremes uh, within the uh, oxycline. And what we found is that we were able to obtain um, roughly 700 proteins and, and over 4,000 proteins, 700 from 100 meters, 4,000 from 200 meters. And in terms of the distribution, we were able to map the vast majority of the proteins recovered at 200 meters to the sub-5 metagenome, whereas very few we could map uh, to sub-5 uh, at 100 meters. Again, so the idea here is that sub-5 probably is an obligate anaerobe. We find it in the anaerobic part of the water column. And under these conditions, we want to know what it's doing metabolically. What genes is it expressing? Can we map the region, that regulon that I told you, and identify specific subunits that are present only under anaerobic conditions. And so if we blow up that interval that I showed you where we have the key linkage of these energy metabolic components, what we find is actually that very few of them are expressed at 100 meters. Okay, we find some of the FCC subunits and some of the uh, NAR subunit, whereas we find the complete repertoire of NAP and NAR at 200 meters. So there seems to be some kind of differential expression going on because we still see that we can measure abundant sub-5 populations at the transition zone. And one of the surprising findings here was that there was this gene over here that we hadn't really paid much attention to before in the metagenome assembly that encodes, as we went back and looked at it, it's highly expressed, it encodes a pentaheme. Uh, protein that's closely related to hydroxylamine oxidoreductase, which is uh, one of the genes involved in the nitrification pathway. In this case, we actually looked more deeply, and there is some precedent for this process to be um, working through a, a pathway known as dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonia. And so one of the working hypotheses now is that under highly sulfitic conditions, sulfide will poison this respiratory complex that sub-5 might actually pump or shuttle, shuttle electrons through nitrite into ammonia. Okay, so why does all this matter with respect to oxygen minimum zones? Well, I told you at the beginning that oxygen minimum zones are places where nitrogen is lost from the system. Say, biological nitrogen is turned into nitrogen gas and it leaves. And that is the end product of denitrification. And there's been a lot of debate in the literature whether bacteria that use classical denitrification pathways through nitrate reduction, uh, NAP or NAR, okay, versus the anamox process, the anaerobic ammonium oxidation process. Okay? And depending on the water column, there seems to be evidence that one of those processes dominates. But what we're starting to understand is that it's not an all or nothing thing and that these groups of organisms are really closely related with respect to integrating their metabolic properties. And we add sub-5 to that mix now. And here's an organism with the capacity to produce 
nitrous oxide as the byproduct, byproduct of its energy metabolism, and that ultimately either produces a greenhouse gas or can be continued on into nitrogen gas and loss from the system, but it may also have the ability under certain environmental circumstances to shunt that nitrate through ammonia, and now that ammonia is actually going to be bioavailable. So understanding how it really tunes its metabolism in the context of oxygen minimum zone expansion is going to be quite interesting and, and, and I hope fundamental. And so where do we go from here is the real question. So I focused on a particular organism. At the taxon structure map that I showed you, there's a lot of microbial diversity in this system. And so we want to be able to use that information and leverage it um, so that we can really understand more about oxygen minimum zone expansion and intensification. And so really what we need to do is, is conduct comparative community analysis. And so one of the things that we've started to do was to basically take the taxonomic inventory from Saanich and compare that to other oxygen minimum zones. And that's actually essential if we're going to justify this as a useful model for understanding other locations. And so the take home message here is if we compare it to the Hawaii Ocean Time Series depth profile to the Eastern South Pacific oxygen minimum zone, we can see some interesting patterns emerge. So here's the surface water out there at Station Aloha, and here's the interior ocean. Here's the eastern South Pacific and Saanich at the surface. We call this a coastal signature. And here's the oxygen minimum zone signature. And so the Chilean system and Saanich are closely clustering together in this PCA analysis of the community <coughs> profile fingerprint. So that, again, that's a good indication that the things that we understand about Saanich are probably going to be extensible to these other environments. And we can take that kind of thinking and apply that to the metagenomic sequence space itself. And so we can cluster our metagenomic inventory and perform various types of statistical analyses, such as ecological indicator analysis, to find genes at this point that we haven't annotated. We call these operational protein families that are specifically associated with a given water column feature or oceanic province, if you will. And so what you can see over here is a hierarchical cluster analysis and indicator analysis of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series depth profile of the Saanich surface waters and then the deep basin waters. And we can actually identify genes that are specifically associated with each compartment of the water column. And then what we can do is we can take that information, those indicators, and we can generate, in this case this is a movie, but we can watch the change of those indicators over time. And we can ask ourselves, for instance, how does this gene family rise or fall in response to different types of environmental events in uh, relation to the physiological state of the water column? So we've used a, a software program here called Grid Analysis of Time Series uh, to generate these plots. And what you're looking at here are these are ecologically defined indicator groups. These are these operational protein families. I couldn't tell you right now what this gene is or that gene is. Uh, but what I'm telling you is that these are genes that are upregulated, if you will. They're more prevalent in the environment um, at this time, at this 100 meter depth. Uh, and then in green, they're downregulated or they're, they're less abundant. And so what we want to be able to do is we want to turn this type of information into an actual monitoring tool so that we can use indicators as diagnostic uh, markers for the water column status. Which just brings me to the end of the talk with respect to the direction of the focus. And so we want to be able to leverage the genomic information to develop micro tools. These would be effectively probes that we can put into the water column to conduct in situ monitoring. And there's good precedent for this. The environmental sample processor developed by Chris Scholin at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute has been shown to be useful in this regard. And so what we're actually doing is we're deploying one of these systems in Saanich Inlet. We'll be customizing probes for our own detection schemes and, and hopefully beaming real-time monitoring data um, in time. And so finally, we want to be able to take this out into the ocean. We want to be able to scale this to the big volume that really matters when we get to the environment as a whole in Earth systems. And so what we've done is we've started to work with the Institute for Ocean Sciences uh, in Sydney, uh, BC, along an ocean time series program known as Line P in the eastern subtropical North Pacific Ocean. And what Line P is, it effectively spans one of the world's most extensive permanent oxygen minimum zones. And so this is a cross-section from the coast to 1,400 kilometers, the tail end, Ocean Station Papa along Line P. And we've been conducting um, a time series sampling program there for the past three years. 
and currently we have uh, uh, libraries in production at the JGI that are going to help us conduct true comparative community genomics with respect to the signature of Saanich Inlet and this massive open ocean oxygen minimum zone uh, that's right in our backyard. So I'll end there and I'll take any questions if you have them. Questions for Steve? So can you grow subfried you know, in the lab? Yeah, no, this was a really good example of can you infer the metabolic needs of an organism from the metagenome right. and then cultivate it. Right. And uh, in my naivete, I, I did a few things. I went to Woods Hole and took the microbial diversity course so that I could learn how to culture sub five. <laughs> and uh, I, I tried really hard, and I, and I cultured a lot of other things, but no sub five. Uh, and then I started looking more in, in, deep, in depth at its metabolism, and I, I realized that we were hedging our bets with respect to whether it's a strict anaerobe or not. Right. And I think now that it's a strict anaerobe, and I just didn't have good technique. Right. So I think the next test is to start working with, uh, uh, in an anaerobic environment, and to give it sulfide and give it thiosulfate and, and see where it, it goes. It seems like you could experimentally prove the hypothesis you have from the, Absolutely. the environmental yeah. data. So that's, that's the goal. The other thing we started to do, though, we were working um, with a group uh, at the MPI in Bremen who do a lot of isotopic labeling. Right, right, right. And so what we started to do is kind of feed the, the bottles full of these microbes, enriched uh, various labeled nitrogen compounds. And so we'll then sort of dissect where the, the label is going. Great. How diagnostic is 16S in terms of uh, <clears throat> metabolism of this organism? So if, if you look at the uh, global scale, would you find similar 6 nests in uh, environments that would not really maintain that kind of metabolism? Yeah, so one of the things that I didn't highlight, and I wish I, I had, raises this question. So the question is, how diagnostic is the 16S gene of sub-5 if you're going to find it in you know, some other environment? Um, and the answer is it's confusing. Because in, we use the Hugenholtz taxonomy, and we, we, we like it. But one of the issues is for the uncultivated organisms in that taxonomy, we're not looking at the fine scale. So there's a group in the Hugenholtz taxonomy called SUP5. But actually, that group also includes another closely related Arctic 19 BD96 or something. And it turns out in the tree that I showed of the SUP5 uh, taxonomic structure, there's two main groups. There's SUP5, where the symbionts are, and then there's this other group, this Arctic group. And they're like 98% identical. That Arctic group is very abundant in oxygen minimum zones, and it is extremely abundant in the open ocean. So if you're just blasting sequences, you'll hit sub-5, but it may in fact be this other gamma proteobacterium. So you really have to kind of go in with a nuanced attitude. Yeah. How diverse is that metabolic cluster, and is it is there any is it on a separate plasmid or a separate piece of DNA? Is it mobile? Is it going in and out? Yeah. Well, okay. So how diverse is the the uh, the metabolic island? Um, basically, the gene content of that island with respect to uh, denitrification pathway components, other bacteria, right? So it looks like those were laterally acquired, indeed. With respect to the mobility of the island as a whole, uh, we don't have any evidence that it's on a plasmid. I mean, we basically have phosmids that span that and that anchor it in the genomic assembly. Uh, but we haven't looked conclusively for integrases or other hallmark signatures of a phage that could have been involved in putting those genes there, for instance. So it's a good, a good idea to go back and look more carefully. Towards the end, you uh, mentioned that your goal was to do this sort of real-time sampling to uh, do that. But earlier in your talk, the data you were showing was like two years old because of the amount of time it takes to synthesize things. Uh, how are you guys going to close that gap? <laughs> hey, I think everybody in the room is probably wondering the same thing. Uh, it's only getting harder. Uh, so it's a great question. So how do you stay in real time with your data? How do you actually become 
proactive as opposed to reactive in the analytical spectrum. And I, I would say that, uh, you know, from a, a lab, individual lab perspective, that's quite a challenge because, you know, we have to build a database. You know, we don't know how to build a database. Okay, we have to learn how to build a database. We have to develop a pipeline. Oh, we don't know how to build a pipeline, so we have to learn how to build a pipeline to put the data in the database in the appropriate manner. And so, you know, the learning curve there keeps us from, I guess, staying on top of things. And as soon as we figure out how to do all that with our meager 350 million base pairs of data, somebody turns around and says, well, we can generate 10 or 100 times more information for you. Um, when do you want us to put it on the FTP site? <laughs> and, you know, you just go, oh, what do I... The, I guess the, the real issue here is how do we take the existing pool of molecular data and identify uh, specific genes that we think are going to speak for the ocean, right? And I think that's a pretty big challenge to do, you know, today, since, because we don't know, as I was talking to Alex, who's going to speak next, you know, we also want to know about 10 years from now. So how do we, how do, we do that? And, uh, I mean, I think one of the ways we do it is we really use the comparative power of different environments, okay, different data sets from those environments, and we look for these indicator genes. We look for uh, gene families that are standing out and saying, you know, I'm found when the nitrate concentration is this and the sulfide concentration is that. And then we put them on some kind of monitoring device so that we can actually see if the expression of that gene is going up or down according to our hypothesis. Um, yeah, so, but your, your question is very valid and, and it will probably only get more and more acute as the data sets grow. You know, you were, you did proteomics to see the genes that were being expressed. Yeah. How did you do that and why didn't you do transcriptomics? Okay, yeah. Um, we, uh, we have less experience with the, the RNA world, uh, but that's a perfectly valid approach that one could take in a high throughput setting. The uh, reason we opted for proteomics uh, in part is because we had an agreement in place to, to do that and we were fortunate that the biomass in our water column is high enough for us to filter relatively small volumes to get enough protein for the mass spec. I think if you were to go out into the open ocean environment, like a long line P, you could not do proteomics. You'd have to do transcriptomics just because you're limited by the amount of material. But it just Sanich Inlet provides us with, um, uh, you know, milligrams of protein. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, that was terrific. You.